But it just seems crazy though, because he's talking about a house that has like double stud walls, R43, R60 attic. But you can't uh, fix the stack effect. You know, yeah. warm air is always going to be I, on top I of I know, but if air. I had triple pane windows, the last thing I'd want to be doing is putting a window unit in. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editor Rob Watsack. Hi. Well, finehomebuilding.com. <laughs> Finehomebuilding.com. Editor Rob Watsack. <laughs> Should we just start we over again? <laughs> we don't let, we're not letting Rob anywhere near the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Fine home building editorial di- director Brian Pontalillo. Hey, everyone. And our producer Jeff Rose. Hi there. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Well, it is good to see you guys here. Thanks so much for being on the show. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So, you know, I've always planned big projects for the Labor Day weekend. It's the time of year when you were really getting antsy about the uh, impending winter weather. And so you feel like you got to get a jump on these projects right and uh rob you've been busy uh working in your basement you've you know used the summer to work in the basement which i find a little odd but you've done a great job with the sink down there <laughs> i've been wor- i have not been working down there all summer it was just a Good. couple of projects here and there no uh you know i bought a water softener years ago and my wife has been begging me to install it and my dad was up for the weekend so I put him to work and he installed the we're, it's a multi-step process because we started with the drain pump since we're below the sewer line in my house in the basement um, I installed we installed one of those drain pumps that goes underneath the, the utility sink and it was surprisingly a lot easier than I expected we had to we had to find a place to send the vent and luckily there was an old cast iron vent pipe going up out my foundation that we tapped into and uh, it ran ran perfectly, so I was excited to get that first step done. Now I've got to go in and um, install a particle filter and a whole bunch of bypass valves and all kinds of stuff and just get that stuff all ready because once we install the water softener, we're going to need to bypass the main line because the outdoor uh, faucets are all off of random places. Mm-hmm. So I need to run a whole new... Uh, run for all the, of those. Because the issue is you don't want to be putting softened water on your landscape, I presume. Yeah, and and also just not wasting the water soft, softened water on uh, hundreds of gallons that are going outdoors. Yeah. What about you, Brian? What do you got planned? Well, I'm hoping to. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> maybe last week on the on the show or two weeks ago, I was talking about my mother in law's deck that I'm refinishing. Yeah. So. I'm hoping to get that done uh, over the course of this weekend. All the all the prep work's done now, so it's just a matter of it's just a matter of applying stain. Um, it's it's coming out really excellent. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, to wrapping it up for. It. Got got had some rain delays over the past few weeks, but um, I think the weather looks pretty good for this weekend. So I'm hoping to uh, hoping to finish that up and um wrapping up some design work on an on an upcoming project that i am uh design and engineering work on an upcoming project that i'm hoping to start uh hoping to be able to get permitted this fall um we'll see if i'm able to get it break ground before the before the winter break ground on what Uh, on a new home (laughs) i don't know if you told anyone so here we go yeah you're building your own house building yes Building my own house. Um, yep. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> so is this going to be like a Amish barn raising? We get all the fine home building staff up there for a couple of weeks and uh, I hope get, so. it, get it done. I hope so, Rob. It's a um, you know, it's a, at, at some point um, when the time's right, I'll, I'll share the design and, and some more information about the project. Um, but it's a very it's very simple house like it's a ranch style house um it's it's, a, it's nearly a square um it's a 38 by 34 um foot house 
And um, so we're, we're talking about four four load bearing walls around the perimeter, um, depending on a couple of, of design criteria that I'm still working out. Maybe um, there'll, there'll be uh, obviously be some load bearing of floor joists um, down down into the basement, and um, there may be a, a load bearing wall above above that in the living area. But that depends on the truss design and some other things. Um, so really, really simple. Really simple home, um, sort of a, an open living space, two bedrooms, two baths. Uh, yeah, looking forward to. So, can I assume it's you know going to meet the more. Li- living building challenge is your your ultimate goal, yes. right? Yeah, <laughs> living building challenge. I hope I'm hoping to meet code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got such a high bar. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you'll be shooting a little higher than that, right? Uh, yeah, I'm still working. I'm still working. <laughs> still, still working all that, all those details out right now. Um, I, I don't know if I already said this, but it's it's just over a thousand square feet. Uh, my my plan at this point is to build uh, with two by four double stud walls, um, dense pack cellulose to get you know somewhere around. Uh, R35, R40 in the walls, and to use, uh, depending on the ceiling design, to use 14 or 16 inch raised seal trusses to get um, into the uh, R50 range of with blown in cellulose in the attic space above. Uh, I would like to shoot for maybe around one ACH50 for air sealing, uh, give or take. And um, yeah, still, I'm, I'm considering windows and, uh, and doors and performance levels for those right now. And um, need to get some um, energy modeling started soon on the HVAC design. That's awesome, dude. Well, yeah, it's exciting. We're here to help. Oh, I know. For sure. I, I, I've got I've got your phone numbers, your email addresses. I know how to slack you. It's time to change all that stuff, right, Jeff? <laughs> Brian. Uh, <no. laughs> Jeff, you have an ambitious project coming up too. We were talking about that ahead of the show. You want to share listen, with listeners what what you're doing? Um, well, I, I, I'm going to actually start on resurfacing my deck. So um, I've got the basic materials, you know, the the, uh, the decking material I had for a couple of weeks now, and just bought the posts the other night, and so it's time to start ripping up the old deck and starting fresh. So what are you going to do with all the old decking while like this is all going on? Um, you're too cheap to get a container, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what kind um, of decking is it? It's PT. PT. Okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, some of it is newish. You know, um, probably like three years old from when I was working on my uh, basement wall because mm-hmm. I had to rip up a bunch. Um, and the rest of it, I will probably just cut up into you know, three foot pieces and start throwing them in my garbage every week. <laughs> well, as we know from experience from some of our readers, uh, that, uh, sometimes all you need to do is put a little free sign or a, a Facebook. Oh yeah. Jonathan would there. just put that stuff out by the curb with, with all the nails and stuff still in it. <laughs> that, that's a possibility for some of it. Um, but a lot of it is just going to disintegrate as I yeah. dismantle because it's really bad. It's, it's needed to be done for years. <laughs> So you went to the office and got the uh, duckbill deck wrecker. I'll be I, curious to hear your thoughts on that tool. Yeah. For folks of you who are unfamiliar, do you want to describe it, Jeff? Um, it's what probably about a four foot handle that straddles the joist, and it has two hooks that slide underneath the the joist or underneath the deck, and so you've got plenty of leverage, and you're on both sides of the joist. So, and you, is your decking screwed or nailed, Jeff? Uh, the new stuff is screwed, and that's really just tacked in place. You know, a couple of screws here and there, so that'll be easy. The old stuff is nailed, and it's the nails are just going to pull through. So it's going to be a lot of pulling the nails out of the joist. That sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep us posted on that. That's that's interesting. Yeah. I've been working on my stairs again. I um, built what I've learned later are, are described as pony walls, which you know, in normal parlance, are short walls and. These go up on the sides of the stringers, and uh, I'm going to put my balusters on top of a one by that's going to go on top of those, and that makes them all the same length, which is a look I kind of like. And I had a lot of trouble deciding what to do about how to make this, but I think I finally figured it out. I was mocking up the handrail uh, later uh, in the weekend and looking at how it was going to look, because when you have winders, you know the handrail has to 
take a different slope. And I think you could make that look wonky if, if you didn't put some thought into it. So I've been trying to not make it. I don't want to do this a third time. <laughs> So uh, speaking of winders, I went to a friend of mine who's a remodeler, works on old, old houses. I was in this house yesterday from 1690 that I might end up doing a railing for, uh, do some metal work for With them. steel, yeah? Yeah, it's for, you know, a nice little forged railing. But I can't, there's no room to do it like you would, like you should, because the, I think at one point it's like 22 inch wide staircase and it's a double, it's like an S-shaped winder that takes up the space of about the space of a coat closet. That and sounds hard, man. It's pretty crazy. So and it's going to be more metal. like grab bars and stuff. They want metal because, you know, wood, you couldn't really readily make the tight radius, I presume, right? Sure. And it's, and you know, like this is, you know, not a major modeling project. They're just looking for something to sort of get a little confidence, a little confidence when they're going downstairs to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I think. It sounds like on that staircase, you would absolutely have to have a rail that was good. Yeah. So as always, we heard from some great listeners. This comes from Andre, who had some thoughts on our conversation regarding uh, design software. We had a listener who uh, wrote in in episode 384 about what's a good design program for a design build model. And uh, Andre writes, hi, podcasters. Just listen to uh, episode 384. Good stuff. Regarding CAD programs, I use AutoCAD LT, the light version at work, at my design build commercial uh, kitchen operation. For the easiest learning curve on its 3D modeling program, I would give SketchUp a go. To be fair, I do not have experience with Chief Architect. You are right on. Most people cannot visualize the 3D implication of their 2D plans. And worse yet, they assume that what is in their head matches what is on the paper without understanding what is on the paper. Also, the software you you use should be able to output a DWIG set so you can communicate the plans to electricians, plumbers, structural uh, engineers, etc., and uh, other trades for their planning purposes. Well, that's good advice. Um, Is DWG the, uh, what is that? Yeah, Uh, it's the file format. AutoCAD file format, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter had some thoughts or excuse me, Andre had some thoughts on Peter's cape, which was the one that his uh, upstairs was really hot. The reason this house is hot is he has good insulation. The sun comes in, heats up the house, and it doesn't leave. Add some window coverings to reduce the, reduce the isolation. What is, is that the right word? Insulation. Insulation? He's insulation, he's saying. You know, as in, 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 in solar, in uh, solar gain. Yeah. Peter said that he's getting a heat pump that replaces furnace, and that will give him the cooling he needs. But don't neglect having your contractor review the duct work as you may need some additional ducting to make the AC work 100% on the furnace replacement. Mini splits are a different conversation. Happy building, Andre. Okay, so uh, shades don't work, right, Brian? Um, you know, it's it's so interesting to, to that con- this conversation is a very interesting one, right? Because um, people swear by shades right they they say they they anecdotally you know i i close the shades my house stays cool but the science doesn't back that the science because the heat's already that, right? in the house the heat's once already it gets in to the, the house. house yeah yeah and this is why this is why in other parts of the world people put shades on the exterior um you know many european homes have sh- exterior shades on their houses you know because if you can block this if you can block the sunlight before it actually enters the house then you're actually you know you're actually doing something so um, I'm not really sure how the uh, you know how our experience and the uh, the science um, you know Mesh. how we re- how we rectify that um, and maybe there's you know maybe there's some value in you know in having the shades to you know I don't know potentially it keeps the it keeps the you know heat gain from entering deeply into the house I'm not sure but you know the science is that once that you know once the that light has come into the house and, and warmed a surface. It's, it's now warm in your house. So if it's warming that shade inside your house, it's warming the inside of your house. That's what I thought too. And I asked you, because I, I distinctly remember under your watch, uh, GBA examined this this very thing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah we've looked at it. Yep. Um, you know, yeah, I, I do you want know to say window films are proven to work. Uh, you yes. Know, s- spectrally selective window films are, are, are very effective. Uh, they can make it look kind of cloudy looking out your window, which some people don't like, but. If your house is cooking and it's a bedroom, you know. Yeah, because like okay you said, 
you figure the shades, if the shades are there, you got an airspace between those shades and the glass. So the heat is getting in, hitting those shades, and maybe it's not hitting surfaces inside, but it's getting in there. So if you block it at the glass level, then you're you're doing some good. Or maybe maybe we need to go back to seeing more of those. Remember in the was the 40s, they had those aluminum uh, awnings on all the <laughs> windows that people retrofitted on their houses. When I was out in Michigan a couple of weeks ago, they were on all the old fifth you know mid-century houses they still had a lot of those things they're you know kind of quaint <laughs> well yeah and it's um i mean that's that's that is um i think we can decide, we can choose aesthetically how to do it but if you properly position a, an awning like that or any shading device and this is this is a big part of of passive house design right um, when you're going for passive house standards is you know using shading devices to um, sized appropriately and located appropriately so that um, based on your latitude um, they can block the high summer sun but um, let allow uh, solar heat gain from the low winter sun and that's and that, a simple calculation architects that you know if you work in a, an area and you do that calculation you, you only have to do that once you only have to learn what it is once and then in your area it's always going to be the same yeah and depending on the windows that can be challenging to do a hundred percent though because you got the low sun in the in the morning and the and the evening that would still come in uh, and that's why really the best shading device and it's sort of automatically regulating is uh, deciduous plants. That's because tough in the desert southwest, it, it, Rob. Well, sure. <laughs> but I'm just saying like for, for people who have that option, obviously you're not going to plant a tree for a shade on your house because it's going to take for a while. Like we've been struggling with the same kind of thing on our sunroom because it's an angled huge expanse of glass and there's no way for us to get shade there we've talked about even planting uh sort of like a trellis like a wire trellis that overhangs it and growing like annual vines on it yeah you know <laughs> we were talking to our managing editor at uh yesterday and uh window shading is akin to me as the same um, fervor that people have about attic ventilation fans, right, Brian? It's one of those things that just will not go away. It's um, right. And what I'm talking about is people are convinced that their attic ventilation fans are keeping their attic cooler and then thereby reducing their uh, cooling load. And a lot of people like put these things in under that assumption. And uh, the science is not backing it up. Similarly, to window shades don't really prevent solar gain because the heat's already in, in the house. Yeah, and this is another thing that's been covered pretty thoroughly on on Green Building Advisor. So, if uh, you're interested in in learning more about attic fans, um, right. search search attic fans on GBA. I'm sure you'll find that uh, Martin Holiday has a thing or two to it say. It took about me 15 him. seconds to find the link to send to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this comes from our friend Brad in Minneapolis. Uh, you may remember him as the hovercraft guy who built the hovercraft from plans he found in Popular Mechanics, which is maybe one of my favorite photographs ever sent to the podcast. Uh, hi, Patrick. In episode 374, you put out a request for anyone doing a project with foam over roof sheathing. We just started a major renovation on a small cape here in Minneapolis. Since we're adding a sizable addition and redoing the existing roof, I spent many hours pondering my insulation strategy. I'll try to keep this short so we could correspond more if you're interested, which we did. Uh, I have a multi-pronged approach that begins with covering the roof with four inches of foam, uh, probably at EPS or two inches of polyiso on the first layer with two inches of EPS on the top. Then I'll have a different plan between the rafters for each of the three different sections of roof, the knee wall section, the slope ceiling section, and the mini attic section, which will be unvented. I'm sure some may poke holes in my plan, but like everyone else, I have constraints to deal with. It is true that contractors aren't keen on this assembly. Despite my contractor's interest in building science and b better building techniques, and he's a fan of your podcast, he's never done this before, and we're working out the details together. I'll throw in one question now that maybe you or someone else may, n might know. What do I really need over the existing sheathing? They're one by eight boards, I think, before laying down the foam. Some have advocated on adhered membrane, Martin Holiday likes Solitex, Mento in his GBA article, and others just say air barrier. But here's the question. How much redundancy is needed in the air barrier? The foam itself, once taped, will, aid, will be an air and moisture barrier. So what's wrong with just using felt or ice and water shield? I suppose the concern is that any air that might get past the assembly would condense on the underside of the roof sheathing installed over the foam. Of course, cost is one issue, but I'm also trying to use products my contractor is already familiar with and are readily available. 
Thanks, love the podcast, Brad. So, why does Martin like solo taxi figure, somebody? That's that's one of those smart uh, air barriers, right? It yeah, I, th- I think it's real vapor open uh, yeah. when it needs to be. I don't know. I think felt will be fine here. I think the the, the question is about durability, and, and so mostly it's uh, um, mostly it's sort of a speculative question. If you have if you have air impermeable foam, and you're going to tape the seams, and maybe you seal it around the perimeters, and and take that time to detail it like that, you know, you, you're certainly creating an airtight you know, an airtight layer with your, with your foam. Oh, yeah. um, people get concerned about foam and, and movement and shrinkage and that as the foam moves and shrinks, that tape's going to peel and lift. And so um, I think, I think many, many builders um, prefer or, or believe more, maybe in the durability of first, you know, doing a peel and stick, um, a peel and stick over the, over the roof sheathing. And, you know, at, it depend depending on what kind of foam you're using um, that, well, actually, Regardless of what kind of foam you're using, uh, vapor permeability doesn't matter in that application because a, a roof with foam over the top is meant to dry inward, not to dry to the exterior. So you could use gray ice and water shields, which is which is not vapor open, and you could use that over the whole roof as a peel and stick membrane if, in that kind of assembly. And you say that it has to dry to the inside, Brian, because we've learned that uh, asphalt shingles are not at all vapor permeable, right? It's like we used to think that, but research has indicated that that is not there is no drying that direction. There's no drying in that direction, and the foam, depending on the type of foam, but any any most foams with with any thickness, they just if if they allow vapor to um, pass, it's very it's still very slow. Even the more vapor open uh, rigid foams are, and if you have any kind of facing on it, like a foil face foam, it's it's not vapor open at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, EP, so, so EPS, so. I think, is is more vapor open. It's the most of those products, the, the most vapor open of those products. But I think you're right. After a certain thickness, it's it's, the, yeah. it's not. <laughs> right. What were you going to yeah, say, Rob? So I was just going to say that, I mean, that was sort of my as- assumption too, is that basically it's it's just a matter of, of trusting trusting how well you can get a material like that sealed for and, and know that it's going to last for a longer yeah. time. Because like, especially, it's one thing to tape the seams, but then you also have to worry about where it meets the edges of the roof too. Are you going to be running sealant underneath the, the edges of the layers of foam? So it's it's just, there's a lot more details that are, that are potentially at risk in the long term if you're not doing a continuous layer of, of an air barrier. Yeah. You know, so you have to think about this, these projects, this process takes a long time. So you're going to have to protect the house uh, in some manner while this is all going on. So it seems to me I would want something pretty freaking reliable that didn't blow off while this was all going on, right? Yep. I, I, and I can tell you from experience, because uh, what was he saying? Was he, was he using, uh, was he thinking about ben, a Benjamin Obdeck product? I'm not sure, but... but uh, so he said Martin I mean, likes Solitax, and he, uh, others say Air Barrier. You know, yeah, he asked so, if he could use felt or ice and water shield, like Brian mentioned, the uh, Grace product. I, I'll tell you, I mean, using that, uh, using that um, Benjamin Obdike uh, self-adhering membrane on the back of my house, I can't tell you how nice it was to know, to just feel confident that I, f- that every single seam and corner and everything was was closed up really well. It just, it just was. I know some people think it's fussy to work with self-adhered membranes, but the result in the end is just is just a really nice, com- comforting uh, result. Did Rob? Did you do any flashing with that material? Did you do any uh, use install any windows or doors? Yeah. So I actually um, I actually used the material itself and a combination of other tapes, but I also was not super concerned about it because. It's got an eight foot overhang, a six foot overhang. Uh-huh. So, gotcha. uh, but, uh, but yeah. So when I mean, people uh, say that, what happens when the next homeowner decides to pressure wash that backside of their house, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, yeah. that's some son, I forget who said that to me, but it's a good point, right? Well, yeah. It I is. mean, there's so many, there's so many future conditions you just can't, you can't always plan for, but, uh, but it's certainly good to think about them. Yeah, I'm, cer- I'm certainly um, one of the products that I've been looking at for the build that I was speaking about at the beginning of the show um, is the uh, self-adhered um, hydro gap. I think that's what you used, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, I was curious. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of things. There's a couple of process things that I'm curious about with the self-adhered membranes, like keeping it um, 
keeping it from adhering above your window so that you can lap it over um, the top flange of the window. Um, I think yeah, someone I just, mentioned. I just cut. I just used a knife and and cut the um, the backer and left a little bit of it on the edge there. Okay. And what I found too is that um, if it was actually not that it wasn't like grace uh, like ice and water where once it touches you can't pull it off. It was if you if you let it flop flap down onto something. Uh, as long as it wasn't something like your vinyl or, or you know aluminum uh, pa painted window frames, um, you when could it peel stuck it up to again. itself, you could pull it back up and reposition it. Uh, yeah, but I would okay. but but I, I I've always found uh, just keeping a certain portion of the backer material on it just in that one. You know, slicing it carefully and keeping a little backer material on it always works fine in that. You were able to do that. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'm curious about is applying tapes to it because it has the spacers for the, the bumps, yeah. For the but drainage. They're, but gap. they're pretty they're pretty small. So as long as you're using a a flexible of enough tape, I, I, I wouldn't feel concerned no problem. about that. Okay. Yeah. Like I cool. like especially one of the more sort of soft and flexible tapes. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Uh, this comes from Kevin. Hello, podcast. This was in yesterday's paper, and I thought it would make for a good topic and maybe a pro talk edition. I've heard the complaints about gaps in modular construction and fire risks. Of course, the conservative fire folks pointed out, and the pro modular community say they've addressed it in various ways. I'm sure the answer is somewhere in the middle, but I do think we need to address it so we can prove safety going forward. So what Kevin is alluding to is uh, in modular homes, there are often these uh, interstitial areas between the modules. And uh, in, in this piece in the Boston Globe, it described how fire can spread through a structure through these, these cavities, right? Um, and sometimes the cavities are pretty big. And... Um, like every other uh, attempt the mainstream media makes with regard to understanding a construction issue, they, they didn't get it right. I mean, they were, they were confusing uh, these mass timber buildings with residential construction. They were, they were mixing in discussions of eye joist, uh, you know, failures in fires. And it was, they were talking about all these different things. It wasn't one single thing. It just, I don't know, it frustrated me. I couldn't even get through it at all. Did you guys read the whole thing? I didn't, but I've come across <laughs> similar articles like that recently where it's a, a person who's a generalist who doesn't understand the technology try, doing their best to decipher the situation. And, and, you're, and, and it is tough to get that stuff right. That's why, that's why it's hard. You know, we find people typically for our, for our staff who have worked in the industry because you got to know that you got to really know the terminology and the, uh, and the technology to, uh, to get it right. Uh, Kevin, it was very interesting. It is obviously a big problem. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, code officials and fire folks, you know, talk about the dangers of eye joists. And, and, you know, in my mind, the industry has addressed that with, you know, now you have to put, and the codes have to, you have to put drywall ceilings or have sprinklers or make some provision to protect those things. There are coatings you can put on them, but um, yeah, there's less, there's less material there, obviously. And we know when we have a campfire, the little sticks burn way faster than the big logs, right? That's, it's just how it is. Uh, this comes from Daniel from Helena, Montana. Hey, crew, I've been working on building a detached garage and have gotten tons of help from FHB and the podcast since day one. I'm putting up siding now, six and a half quarter inch hardy plank, and it looks like the windows I ordered won't be in until late September or October. I don't want to wait that long to finish the siding. I was hoping to install the windows once they came and cut it into the siding for the windows at that time. They are two foot by four foot windows and the framing is there, but I sheathed the house and wrapped over the entire wall. Is there anything I can do now to plan ahead for when the windows come in and to make the post hoc window install easier? Specifically, I'm thinking about WRB and water management. I'm using uh, Benjamin Obdike HydroGap and their compatible flashing tape, and I'm worried that I won't be able to get this stuff to the full width around the window opening if the sodding is already in the way. I've considered trying to put the tape up where the openings will be before the siding goes up, but wondering if there's a better way. Any thoughts here? Who wants to go first? I got an idea. I mean, the, the, main, the main problem is, and this is a similar problem people run across in remodels, is like if you've got something tight to your window opening, you're not going to be able to flash it well. So I, I don't know what his uh, window trim detail is, but if I were doing this, I mean, I would make sure that I had 
a window casing that was wide enough that I could leave the siding back far enough to do all the flashing in, in place afterwards. You know, you probably slide your, uh, you, you leave the, like we were talking with the window just a moment ago, you would leave your top of your uh, head, the head open, so you could slide flashing up under, under slide the everything up underneath it, including uh, um, a cap flashing for the top of the casing. Head flashing, right? Yeah, and um, and just leave enough width there. You know, design your casing detail. I mean, obviously, if he's already got the house plan, maybe that doesn't fit into the aesthetic plan that he had. But but if I if if I if I knew I had to install windows later, I would I would. I would do. I would leave some sort of detail that would leave a space around the windows to make sure you had enough room for the flashing. So uh, Daniel does plan to install uh, casing over his flanged windows. I should have mentioned that because I asked him that very question. If he was trying to install, you know, a flangeless window, I think this gets uh, more difficult even than this is. But do you have thoughts, Brian? Oh, you're on mute there, Brian. We're going to have to come back to Brian because he... <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I read the question, I thought the same thing as, as Rob. It's, it's a matter of how much room you have to work around the window. So um, the, only way to, the only way you're going to do this and, and, and flash the windows right is to make sure that you're going to have enough room. So if, if um, think about the, the width of the flange and the width of the pieces of tape that you need to get on there. And if you can, if your trim is, is sized uh, appropriately, you could do it. And if not, you're not going to get that. If, if not, then you're not going to get that uh, flashing behind the siding. I was thinking about this too, and I agree with everything you guys have said. I might go even a step further to make a mock-up of the exact um, cased window opening out of plywood or something and use that to fit the siding because I, I personally, I have very difficult great difficulty not putting siding up to something. It, you know what I mean? If you're trying to like run a straight line, it doesn't work. I mean, if you're off a 32nd or a 16th of an inch, it, it, it doesn't work. It looks wacky. So I would, yeah. I would, I would prep the opening, you know, and, and put the plywood or make a picture frame type things to, to fit your siding around it. So when you do go to put the window and casing in, it's going to fit right. You're not going to have to fudge it. Yeah. I wonder if you could even pre-assemble your trim, put it, you know, temporarily if, put it in place and side up to it. And then you if have you know trip, how wide exactly your, your, your window windows is, yeah. are, because I mean, you yeah. know, you, sometimes it's hard to know what the little bumps are on the edge of the, of the, of the frame and whether you've got to clear yeah. something and you leave so, a little bit of a gap. So uh, yeah. window companies have architectural drawings that, I mean, That's they, they actually have shop drawings that show every freaking yes. measurement, you know, so you're going to want to really study that and make sure you know what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, you know, in worst case scenario, uh, Patrick, because like you think about how you install a lot of uh, continuous materials like decking, sometimes you end up cutting things in place. And Josh Odwin just did a retrofit video for us on a very similar situation and as a remodel where he was installing a window and flashing it into a wall. And what he did is he slid some sort of uh, like vinyl flashing material or some other material underneath the siding so he was able to cut it back without damaging the WRB underneath and was able to basically do a retrofit job of exactly what you're talking about where he got a, a cut you know, where he was able to cut the siding back to the width of the new casing. Um, alternatively, Daniel, why don't you just wait till your windows come in to side, <laughs> you know? Right? <laughs> why not? He's impatient. He wants to get the job done. I mean, you know, it's scary to have your house just in, you know, WRB, right, for any length of time. And it's not supposed to be exposed very long. But, I mean, we're talking weeks, not months. Hopefully. Well, I don't know if that... I don't know if that's true these days. I, mean, I, I just heard recently about a, someone who ordered a non-standard window size and was told 10 to 12 weeks for delivery. And this was from Marvin Windows, who's a, you know, Custom window U, maker. U.S. Yeah. supplier. So uh, I think lead times are long right now. Well, he says it's supposed to come in the end of September. Uh, but, you know, that could be delayed, of course, right? Yeah, he's probably also thinking, of, depending, where is he from? Montana? Weather? Hell in you know? Montana. He's, he's got to get freaking busy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This comes from William. Hello, podcast. I'm a big fan and I've enjoyed listening for a few years. I finally have a question. I live in Richmond, Virginia and have a brick addition I want to whitewash. The brickwork is really bad and I'd like to obscure the mortar joints if possible. 
I don't want to do something as involved as stucco. White Portland mixed really wet and brushed on sounds easier than lime. I'm seeing stuff about mixing in salt and alum and leaving it overnight. What do you all suggest? Thanks so much, and I appreciate the podcast. So do you guys, I'll, I'll be the, I'm going to say this. I, I don't know anything about whitewashing. Do, do either of you? Well, Rob? <laughs> what I was going to say is, because I've, you know, I've wanted to do work on my basement walls, and, I, and they're all limestone. So I'm, you know, I'm always nervous about, about that because uh, anybody who's worked on antique buildings that have older mortar or softer bricks or, or sedimentary stone that's, that can be sensitive to moisture, especially in cold climates, um, know that you have to get your mortars and, and, your, and your finishes right on, on some of those older materials. And um, there's actually the National Park Service has these preservation briefs on working on historic buildings. They've got a lot of stuff on more on, on masonry structures. So I would say that would be my first place to go look. It's just nps.gov. And you, uh, I'm not sure the uh, we'll put a link in the in the podcast. But uh, I, I think that you always have to match your stuff like this, especially on older, uh, older masonry surfaces to the the materials that were used when it was built. And um, so, so I would, if I, if I didn't find that information there, I would certainly talk to somebody. I mean, Richmond is a, is a very historical city. So I would, I would, I would find an expert in the area, whether there's somebody in, in a, in a company that works uh, on preservation or a local historical society is going to know best what works well in that, in that environment. Uh, Jeff or Brian, thoughts? Well, I think that uh, he, he, I think he should look into lime washing, which specifically. He says he doesn't is, want to do that. Why do you think that is? Um, he says Cause it's a maintenance because it's a, it's a long term easier is what he says. Yeah, lime lime washing. The, lime washing is something that over time you will need to maintain. And it's also you got to get the right materials and it's sort of a, get the right mix. There's a couple of uh, good companies um, in the in the. Mid Atlantic and Northeast. There's actually one in Pennsylvania. I got to look them up, but that that sell all the right products to do this right. Um, yeah. So I can I can. Put what are you that saying, Brian? There. You you were well. Yeah. Well, lime. I mean, the difference. I mean, if if like people people call people water down paint, latex paint, and put it on brick and call it whitewashing. And I mean, when you paint anything, you have a maintenance issue too. And paint often doesn't do well. On brick and 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 off and and not only does it sometimes you know fail on brick um, and then you have you know you have a maintenance issue there but also it 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 um, you know when you apply a basically a plastic coating on top of brick now you prevent brick from doing what it wants to do which is absorb and release water um, lime washing is it from what I know about it, and it's not, I don't know a lot, but from what I know about lime washing, it's more akin to like staining wood than painting wood. In other words, the lime wash soaks into the brick and it doesn't obscure those properties, those masonry properties that you want in a uh, mass surface, mass wall kind of construction where the brick and the mortar can both, you know, absorb and release, you know, moisture with, with weather and temperature and, and all of that. So, um, I would, I would at least look into it. I don't think it's a, a more difficult process than painting. I think it's a very similar process to painting once you know what, you know, once you know, um, once you research materials and, and know how to mix it properly. I want yeah, to say yeah. one thing, cause I know people are going to be like yelling at their devices right now, but you know, so Richmond is a warm place. The, the concerns we're talking about with uh, Portland cement based products and, and masonry are a greater problem in, in areas with freeze thaw, right? Because the Portland is much harder than the lime mortars and, uh, you know, masonry products. So for sure. But it's not just a matter of freeze thaw too, though. It's also a matter of, uh, of the capillary action and the efflorescence. And if you put a impermeable surface over the, um, over the wall, um, you're changing the the hydrodynamics of that of that wall, and you're not allowing the salts to come out. The so the lime washes and lime plasters are considered on old masonry buildings so sort of a sacrificial coating that allows the salts to uh, to sort of come out at the surface of the lime itself and not on, in the the surface of the actual stones or bricks or mortar, which can, the, there's like that I think it's like thousands of psi of hydrostatic pressure with 
with with uh, capillary action in so it can like drive that stuff up an entire wall of a building mm. and so you, the the lime is actually it's a much more compatible uh, material with a lot of those older stones and and mortars and it and it it, it won't because I've, I've seen places where they've put um a portland-based stucco over an old brick wall and then they get the spalling behind the stucco that they can't even see because and then eventually that it just flakes off Jeff, what do you know about whitewashing? Not a whole lot. Just only what I've learned here. Uh. <laughs> I got one suggestion. Uh, so my friend Philip Hansel, who owns Hansel Painting in Durham, North Carolina, um, is called to paint people's brick homes that what, that they don't like, right? So the product they use a lot is made by a com- company called Roma Bio. And uh, what I like about this thing is there are uh, technical data sheets on this product it, on the company website. And like, unlike the kind of homebrew uh, lime washes and uh, other things that we, we've t- we're talking about, like this is a manufactured product. It probably has some things added to it to make it more reliable, stick better, what have you. You know, I would, I don't think this is a, a good idea to experiment you know, I, I would try and, and get a tested product or, a, you know, a good mason who, who's done this or, you know, and it's probably going to ma- be the mason who's, ha- who's got decades of experience, right, when, when, you know, this was more common. Yeah, and, that, and that's why I was saying it's certainly best to go to a local person because, I mean, if you go to, if you've ever been to Richmond, there's just street after street of these beautiful brick row houses. And uh, so there's certainly going to be some experts down there who know what they're doing with those things. Any uh, further thoughts on this, anyone? Just that that just that that expert may not be a painter because so you know some painters will, will want to do what they know how to do, which is come in and paint the brick. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and they even even really good painters made it, you know that's what painters do. So um, I like the suggestion of talking to a mason or someone who or just you know or a remodeler with a lot of experience on older houses and brick houses and you know starting there. Uh, this comes from Ben in Pittsburgh. Go Steelers, Ben! Uh, hey there, I have a three-year-old who likes to work with me and my dad on house renovation projects. We're preparing to fully gut the second floor of our house, and I think it would be fun for him to demo old plaster. He's already done some unauthorized demo in a closet with a hammer. <laughs> but old houses are nasty, and I always wear a full-face respirator for demolition. I'm wondering if you or your listeners know of any kid-sized full-face respirators, as well as more general sources for kid-sized safety equipment, like glasses, gloves, and earmuffs. Thanks. Ah, so I have a little experience with this. Uh, you know, when Liam was really little, I was in the process of building this building, and uh, he was interested in helping with me. So I happen to know that uh, 3M makes... Uh, earmuffs for little kids as an example. And I went to the uh, earplugstore.com and found a dozen or more different v- varieties of hearing protection for little kids. Uh, so, you know, folks who are into shooting sports and that kind of stuff need these things because the kids start early. So, um, and people who take their kids to NASCAR races, I, I see them wearing earmuffs too because they're definitely loud. As far as the other stuff, it seems like Safety equipment companies are probably reluctant to offer a lot of gear for little kids, right? It's maybe it's yeah. a liability. I don't know. But, but you guys have any thoughts? Well, if you're really going to do it, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we're probably in a really good time to find this thing because if you just search Google N95 masks, I mean, you figure all the dust masks that I use in my wood shop before COVID were just plain N95 masks. There's tons of those now available for little kids. I mean, uh, most of the quick searches that I did just took me to Amazon. So I don't necessarily know the reliability of, of those, those sources, but I'm pretty confident that with some careful Googling, you could uh, find some good sources for, for, for for a 95 mask for kids. I know the uh, 3M product that I I use uh, has an S size, which is small. And and the, the cup is, is much smaller in diameter, probably an inch or more. And uh, I got them for Liam in this period, and uh, quickly he needed the bigger size because, uh, you know, little kids grow quick. I don't, and uh, I would say a full face shield. You know, uh, you do not want to get 
you know, anything in your kid's eyes, right? Just the conversation at the ER about what were you doing would be pretty awkward alone. Um, so I, I would look for a shield and that stuff's available because kids take uh, chemistry classes and have labs, even in little kids in some schools. So that stuff is available. I don't know if you're going to find a full face respirator. I, I looked and I couldn't find a, a little one. And I think it's because uh, they're expensive for starters. And, you know, I think there's probably just a lower demand and manufacturers try and make stuff that they sell a lot of, I think. Any other uh, suggestions, guys? Jeff? Uh, just, I, I'm just concerned about, you know, being really aware of what you're dealing with in terms of lead, asbestos, things like that. I mean, dust you can deal with, but those things are a lot more, or any VOCs. That's a really good point, especially lead with small with children. I mean, they're the most susceptible to uh, health health concerns from lead. So if you're in an old house, you certainly don't want you know pre pre nineteen seventy eight is uh, you you need to be checking that very diligently. And Pittsburgh has a lot of old housing stock, so there's a good chance of uh, you know Ben's house has lead paint. Uh, here comes a question from Will. Hey, podcast. I hope you all are well. Keep up the great work on the podcast. I enjoyed it each week, including last week as I held our new baby girl in my arms at the hospital, Haiti Rose Bowen. Starting her young. That is fantastic. Uh, congratulations, Will. Uh, anywho, our home is a Huntington custom home project that I designed. Here is some background on it. It has double... R43 stud walls, an R60 attic, triple pane windows, a Mitsubishi heat pump downstairs. This is the primary uh, heat source, uh, so it's a mini split. I got clarification from him. Uh, it has a completely open downstairs with a half bath, three bedrooms with a full bath upstairs. There's a gas stove in the living room for ambience. Uh, it has an HRV from Venmar, an E15. The exhaust is in the bathrooms with boosters. There's ex exhaust in the kitchen and fresh air to all remaining rooms. Uh, with the heat pump on the first level, we have a good system for heating the home. In the winter on the coldest days, we keep the first level at 70 and the bedrooms, which don't have their own heat, remain at 65. So I'm looking for a more effective solution for cooling upstairs. Currently, we're running a heat pump in dry mode. The, up, the downstairs is a comfortable 69 degrees and we've got a box fan positioned halfway up the stairs, pushing the air upstairs. On the second floor, we have another fan sending air across the hall toward the bedroom. And in the bedroom, we have a ceiling fan running. On top of this, I'm running the HRV in recirculation mode, which doesn't bring in fresh air. All of this is doing a good job at keeping the entire house comfortable. The upstairs is 75 to 74, but far less humid than the muggy outside. What is annoying about this is that all the fans, cords, and recirc mode of the HRV. Question. I think the current heat pump could cool the entire house. The issue, issue is delivery upstairs. I'd like to avoid installing another heat pump for the upstairs. I've got some locations where I could install some small ducted transfer fans to get that air upstairs. There's access to power and the ability to install light switches. Do you think these should be installed in pairs? So is one sending air up and another sending air down? I figured I'd install these off regular switches versus anything via a thermostat. Also, as I recall, you had a fan brand you liked, good quality. Uh, obviously, something quiet would be important too. So that company is Fantech. I'll just get that out of the way. So the question is, he wants to cut holes in his floor to bring cool air from the downstairs and blow it upstairs to cool off his bedrooms because his only cooling plant is on the first floor. So is this a good idea, gentlemen? Huh. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'll go first. It's wacky. Yeah. yeah. It's Will. It's wacky. Get another heat pump upstairs and, and be done with it, right? It's, you know, it's going to cost a couple grand probably, but, you know, this is weird. You can't put like holes in the floor and put fans in them. I mean, in the old days when people had like a wood stove in the middle of their house, they'd have those grates in the floor that they could open and close, but I'm sure that they weren't getting comf comfortable evenly. Uh, tempered rooms throughout the entire houses. Yeah, and they were also using, the, the, you know, relying on the stack effect to bring the warm air up. And this, he's talking about cold air. And like, 
he, he's wondering if he needs to also push the air down, which it gets even more convoluted at that point. I'd, I'd, I'd be curious how, how often during the summer he, he, it's actually uncomfortable up there because, you know, could a window air conditioner take care, take the edge off on just those times of year where it's actually uncomfortable up there. And if it's, if it's not a whole lot of, of the summer that, that, you know, he feels like he needs that additional cooling up there. I would, I'd say, go out, go to Best Buy and buy a window air conditioner. For 200 bucks, right? But it just seems right. crazy though, because he's talking about a house that has like double stud walls, R43, R60 attic. But you can't uh, fix the stack effect. You know, yeah. warm air is always going to be I, on top I of know, cooler I know, but if air. I had triple pane windows, the last thing I'd want to be doing is putting a window unit in. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, this is, this is the, this is, I mean, this is not, um, and there's probably no window unit's going to fit in a tilt turn window, right? Uh, you know, if, if that's what he has. If they're tilt turns, that might yeah. be true. I'm not sure about air conditioners in them. Um, this is, you know, this is common. This is very common feedback now for houses that have, because they have low loads and people are putting in, um, they're putting in, you know, a, a mini split heat pump, usually with like a head on the first floor and then, and maybe a little bit of backup heat here and there, but nothing on the second floor. And this is regular feedback um, that we're hearing from people in these, in houses like this, that, you know, most of the time it's pretty good, but either at the hottest or the coldest times of the year that it's just not, it's just not doing it. Yeah, when you when you have a device that's that's sized for a certain load and you don't need that load most of the time, it's like it's barely pushing the like I find that like when my house is really hot and when it's really hot outside with my mini splits, the whole house is cooled off nicely because the air the mini splits are cranking. But when when it's like kind of okay outside and and I actually need some dehumidification, like I actually find that my house gets more humid when it's like 70 degrees outside than when it's because 90 they're just not running outside. enough because they're just not running enough right yep you're alluding to brian that this has been a topic of uh, gba q and a's a, a number of times and what folks say is you need heads on both floors even in you know um predominantly heating climates because you know in the summertime you the upstairs unit does the cooling and in the wintertime the the downstairs unit does the heating and because they're uh, the house is efficient, there, there's little energy penalty, and it's not like you're running two compressors at the same time to deal yeah, with Yeah, it's the not load. about it's not about uh, loads and BTUs. It's about delivery and stack and it's distribution stack effect. and stack yeah. effect. Yeah, you know, you could uh, you know maybe the you know maybe in a lot of these cases the solution is a ducted mini split. You know, the um, ductless mini splits aren't the only efficient option. You can duct a conduct a mini split too, but um, but yeah, this is a, isn't uncommon feedback. Yeah, I mean, du you know, a mini split in a small house that's very well insulated works well if it's a very open plan or if it's on one floor. If you do, you can get away with a single head. But uh, like you, uh, you find this in your own home, Rob, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, I uh, we're we're sort of we're kind of unusual because we're we were already used to heating with a. Um, uh, pellet stove and we've got two staircases so we do like this kind of dance of like opening and closing doors to let the circulation go f up one staircase and down the other and and but that is not the way most people want to live in their homes <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh, let's just for the academic exercise uh w how how would the f the fans work and would would you need one blowing down and one blowing up or would it just would the cool air displace the warm air if you i mean is is this even a, a theoretical i mean option? you know some people do some people do talk about i don't know how successful it is uh using their um um their heat recovery ventilation system as a as Mixing. a sort of secondary distribution system in in a house with a mini split um but i mean it, it, you know I'm, and, and i'm almost kind of surprised that the fact that he has that he doesn't have sort of more balanced circulation but it sounds like he's running a lot of these systems sort of in unconventional ways like running the mini split only in dry mode and running the uh the hrv in recirculation mode so they're sort of not doing all the things that they're well, intended to be doing so interestingly, the window air conditioner that's in the barn has a, a dry mode, and I keep it on that too because um, it satisfies the set point in the normal operating temperature before the rest of the barn can be dehumidified. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it's a relatively small space where it's at, so it'll get to 72 degrees 
pretty readily with sensible cooling, but the rest of the barn is still un uncomfortably humid. So it, it, I think that's why he's doing that is to help uh, make the upstairs more comfortable is my, is my assumption. Yeah. I and believe I imagine, that the, uh, oh, go ahead, Rob. I was okay. And I imagine if you're running the, if you're, if it's comfortable downstairs, you don't want to just overcool the downstairs to try to distribute the, the cooling upstairs. So you're, so you're, that's why the, he's come up with this idea of, of running fans to try to pull the air upstairs and get some of that hot air to come down and, and sort of balance things out. Right. You know, so if you have tilt turn uh, windows, Will, and you can't put in a window air conditioner, you can cut a hole in your house, and I'm sure that gives you the willies to even think about that. And you're in your like passive house quality, super tight house, but um, you know, you could do it. And I mean, it's life's too short to be like <laughs> uncomfortable while you're sleeping. I think you guys would agree, right? Jeff, you got air conditioners everywhere. <laughs> well, I mean, I, ha I have a whole house air conditioner, and then I have a window unit right in my office for the right. same problem that Will has, right? Because the upstairs is, doesn't uh, respond to to the the cooling as well as the downstairs, right? Yeah, and I've got an, a lot of a high heat load in this room for the. You're running all those super editing so uh, processors, right? Right. Yeah. Um, should, we'll, we'll put a link to one of the good discussions of this on the uh, GBA uh, Q&A section because, you know, I know there's been a lot of discussion of this very issue and maybe there's some folks there that have other suggestions on how to get some better distribution, but I think it's going to come down to getting another mini split upstairs, if I had to guess. And you guys want to say before we uh, part company today? That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well i want to wish everybody you're going to hear this after the uh, long labor day weekend but y'all hope you all had a nice long weekend and uh i want to remind you that uh to send your questions to and clean up requests to fhb podcast at taunton.com and please like comment or review us no matter how you're listening it helps other folks find our podcast stay safe everybody keep craft alive happy building and thanks very much for listening